What's going on? It's Ed here from Junk Marketing Team, and I'm here with Jake Still from Junk Rescue. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Welcome to the show. So uh, give me a little bit of background on your history in the business, uh, when you got started, revenue numbers, or, or number of trucks, um, number of employees. Just give me a little bit of background about Junk Rescue. Okay. So uh, I actually worked in the space in college. Okay. Uh, the guys, one of you got junk in college hunks in college, uh, but primarily as a laborer. And then, um, you know, I had, I was going to Westchester university for, uh, marketing and upon graduation, I talked to the boss and I was like, Hey, I gotta, you know, figure out what I want to do with my life. And I didn't have a really career set path. In the meantime, so he was like, why don't you do a little bit more sales and marketing for me? That's your background. Right. Okay. So I, I stayed this summer. I got to learn a little bit more details into the scope of the business beyond labor. Um, and as well as. I was doing sales and marketing, but it was a small franchise, so I was also doing everything, yep. uh, and including hiring and staffing, running routes, all that kind of stuff. So I understood a little bit more, uh, but I had friends that actually worked in the medical space. So I went and chased that money, and I went into a, uh, medical device sales. So sure. I sold aesthetic lasers to dermatologists and plastic surgeons. Uh, I did that for two years. Uh, during my first year of it, me and my partner now, my brother-in-law, were on our way to Yankees game. And he, you know, was asking me, yo, are you happy? And I was like, no. And he said, what do you want to do? And I was like, I always want to be an entrepreneur and own my own business. He said, what would you do? And I was like, I really like the junk model space for cool. I like the margins. It was cool finding stuff. But I, I really just like being a white collar guy in a blue collar space. I really liked what those companies would do, were, were doing and bringing out the, the brand marketing, which is also my background in marketing, um, as well as just that fresh feel in the service industry. Um, but then the questions are, what, what stopping me? Well, capital, money, where to start? And really the, the big, biggest thing is just the fear of failure, right? The fear of the unknown. Yep. So to about two weeks later, we're in uh, a short house. And um, he's like, congrats, we're like business owners. I'm like, what? He's like, I just signed this up for an LLP. And yeah, he called it South Jersey Junk Removal at the time. And I was like, I still have my job. Like, I don't even want to do business with right now. Uh, and nothing against him in person. It's just not what I wanted to do. Well, it just so happens, he's like, relax, it takes a year to get your license in New Jersey. A year came by and they dissolved my, my division, the medical sales. And I was like, do I, and it just so happened that the license was approved. So I was like, do I stay in the medical space or do I, you know, become a trash man? And I did the sensible thing and I became a trash man. So, uh, you know, it took, uh, we, we decided the one thing, if we were going to go into it, we we're going to go all in or all out. Okay. And, you know, again, commit to it completely. We did. Uh, three months in. Uh, in August of 2016, we did our first job. Um, but even by January of 2021, we only had like $60,000 in revenue, like not much. Um, primarily because we had no working capital when we, we started it. We, had, we, we you know, standard junk guys just doing it in one box truck. Uh, and then at that point, we had enough proof of concept. We're like, all right, we can take out a little bit of investment. So we did that. He took out against his 401k, um, gave us enough money to buy a dump truck. And from there, once we discovered actually what you can do with working capital and working a little bit smarter, um, you know, we were able to continue to expand to where we are in 2020, 2020 now with 10 dump trucks. Um, I think we have 45 dumpsters. We just got a new shipment in. 45 rental containers, seven junk removal containers that stay with some of our, our junk trucks. And then um, 35 employees. And yeah, yeah, just servicing at one location currently and we're in the process of franchising and opening up additional locations as well. Nice, that's awesome. So 35 employees, how many of those are um, field labor versus in-house? So including some of our part-time, we like to try to have 17 guys, 18, you know, 20 guys, 17, 18, like full-time every day. Okay. Um, and then some of our know, part-time coming here on the weekends, especially because everyone knows it's a minimum six days a week business. Sure. Uh, we're in, and also looking into like, how do we get night shifts in, right? How do we use more of our resources at night when they're not making this money? Sure. So we can do expand that as well. Uh, trying to figure out how we can capitalize with our assets that we have. Gotcha. And then um, uh, we also have, we have a box truck and two pickup trucks as well. Got it. All right. And uh, the pickup trucks, do they actually do junk or are they more project manager style? Manager, but also it's just, a, again, utility vehicle I have. So it's good for sales estimates, but it's also good need to go run and pick something up real quick, yep. you know, deliver tools to a job, whatever it may be. So it's really just utility, you know, whatever we need for that time. Got it. Um, Got it. So, um, we, do jobs, but we, we don't think it's good for the image. To not be sure. Sure. So you're, you're um, South Jersey, Philly. 
Um, so we actually only in New Jersey now. We cut out Philly. Gotcha. Um, so one major mistake that for anyone out there watch this, it's really easy to just go grab revenue wherever it is, especially when you do PPC and do other marketing things. You just right. turn it off. You yep. same thing, turn it on elsewhere. But it really hurts your logistics. It really hurts your market saturation. It really hurts your management because it's way harder to manage. Again, you know, the truck breaks down farther away. Yep. So we're in the process of we, we cut out Pennsylvania, um, but we're actually we'll still service it for our VIP clients as well as you know, the job makes sense, but we're no longer marketing in Pennsylvania. Uh, and we plan on opening new locations there um, to, to you know, handle it separately. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, take me back to when you got your first truck, um, your, your first dump truck. Was it a... Uh, used truck was it was it new T talk to me about that story so our first truck ever was a box truck okay um 2006 uh a suzu cab box truck 16 footer uh we use that and that actually just died like six months ago so we got you know good use that end. Worth. yeah yeah <laughs> uh and now it's just you know a billboard for us sure and then um my uh my brother-in-law also had a pickup truck we put that towards the business got it wrapped and he, he got that for free and then in 20, um, 2017, we bought our first Insuzu cab dump truck. Yep. Um, and that was definitely just like a game changer as far as logistics, logistics go and yep. yeah, how many jobs we can get into a day. The use, ease of prediction, obviously how long it's going to unload compared, compared to having to predict how long the you know, hand unload was going to take. Right. Uh, little things like that, you don't realize that there, there's like these special nuances and, and how you actually do the job. Rather than oh we're just picking stuff and putting it down like every yep. every every measure of time has value, yep. um, and uh, that was the dump truck just made it so much easier to do that. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, well, talk to that. Talk to that actually, guys that are, are starting out with a box truck or still in the model of using box trucks versus a dump truck. What what kind of really pushed you towards uh, just biting the bullet and going towards the dump? Well, I guess we didn't really fully like bite the bullet, right? That's why I went with the box truck in the beginning because we didn't know where to start. It was much cheaper. Yep. You know, our dump trucks uh, with cans cost us like 75000 Okay. Um, so, yeah, it was like, again, when we came to that point, like, when we bought the bought, bite the bullet in that sense, we were actually like, can we afford it? Because right. even though we started to have a little bit more success and proof of concept, it didn't mean we had cash flow. Yeah. So, you know, we had to take that, that jump to say, hey, how much business more, how much more business is going to do or how much more time is this going to alleviate so we can concentrate on other things to build more business? Yeah. Um, so we just realized that if we wanted to grow, we knew that was part of the, the, the way to scale. Um, we just didn't think box trucks were scalable. Yeah. So. Um, what's the number you guys, you, you seem like a very analytical guy. Everyone what's, says that. <laughs> and I, like, yeah, I don't know. I guess I am, especially in this space, maybe. Sure. Uh, and I appreciate it because I'd love to be more of an analytical guy and still yeah. figure that out. But yeah. What, what's the... Um, What's the metric you guys put to a box truck versus a, a dump? Like, is it an extra job per day? Is it an extra one and a half um, labor hours for uh, box versus dump? Like, what's the metric you put on it and said, okay, that's it. This proves the math. We're going dump. Like, what, what was well, that? Yeah, so two jobs a day. Okay. Easily. Yep. And that's the standard rate. There's some days you can get four more jobs in a day. Um, it's about a half hour time at the dump. Yep. Uh, especially depending on the load. So if you have furniture, like we'll, we'll still do some hand loading sometimes because if you source a separate truck, yep. you've got to calculate that math in your head and say, all right, does it make sense to source separate put the metal here or donations here and then hand unload this portion? Because if I put donations and trash in the same truck, I can't go just dump it. I have to hand unload. Right. So we do those calculations. Around a half hour, you know, okay. on per full truck. And usually you dump maybe twice a day, you know, depending on how big your, how big your trucks are yep. and how much you pack. Um, but you can expect at least twice a you know, two dumps. So you save an hour right there in, 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 in that part of logistics. Yep. But that's also, you know, if you get really heavy time, jobs, you have to send two guys to the dump to a hand load and, and things are jacked up in there. Yep. As opposed to if you have a dump truck, you leave one guy on site and one guy goes to dump and he comes back. There's just more logistic options that way as well. Uh, on top of that, we have the roll off containers. So we can have source separating um for different materials back on site uh as well as just an extra can when the dumps are closed sure, sure. Big part of it as well. got it okay um take me back to to the start how were you getting the phone to ring for business what type of marketing were you doing so we started off with any kind of direct marketing that made the most sense that was really because again without capital you don't you can't take that many chances so right. you need to know your return at all times so 
people hate home advisor and there's dread of, you know, Yelp sites and Angie's and all that kind of stuff. But you, it's really, they have built in CRM systems. So you can track the data yep. track the return pretty easily. Um, so, you know, we, we started there and then expanded to more SEO, more PPC, more social media, um, more direct mailers, more, you know, uh, trying to get that some networking and, and B2B sales. So, you know, we, we, we started with whatever we thought we can measure and get an actual return on mm -hmm. to limit risk. And then now we're concentrating more and more on brand awareness and brand saturation. Now that we have that, um, to, to try to capitalize on our, like our other marketing efforts, yep. um, you know, all marketing efforts help each other as far as that brand awareness goes and you keep getting, you know, a better close ratio on every campaign, the more awareness you have. Right. Right. And I'll put a link to their website in the, uh, the description and also on, on the, the blog post. Um, can you move your camera and show us your, uh, your logo in the background? Yeah. So, well, funny thing. So actually for our franchise company is actually service rescue. Okay. Um, because of trademark issue for, for regionalizing. Sure. Um, but we're also expanding on our goal is to expand with a moving company, uh, as well as move rescue and you know, you know, separating or dumpster company as well. Sure. More revenue streams. Yep. Um, and yeah, we believe you can do it all, but you have to separate actual divisions, separate companies to do multiple things. So you're not just chasing that, that next, uh, that next shiny object syndrome, right? Like, yeah. Oh, we do junk. Most of our clients are moving. Let's do moving right. as well. And we don't want to do that. We want to have a, we'll do moving as well, but that's a separate company, separate division, not using shared resources. And then you can, you know, expand that way. Yep. Yep. So talk to me about, um, how important branding has been for your business. So that's one thing that I realized too from being, you know, with those other larger national companies and everything and being my background, um, we were pretty close to this branding from day one. Mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of time in, in developing um, the logo, the brand, the colors, and the, even the science behind the colors, uh, what kind of feelings that portrays or, or our demographics and psychographics. Um, and then, you know, with that, building the story around your brand, having your core values, uh, we actually just rehashed our core values again, uh, trying to really still find out, you know, what really encapsulates who, who we are um, and building our story into this. So like, for example, I just built our training manuals and for right now, every single client in our training manual is like a villain. So whether it's, you know, Ivan Drago from Rocky, whether it's, um, you know, Lex Luthor, whatever it is, trying to build that culture and story into the brand and everything we do. And that's not just on the external to the clients, but that's what's internal to our, our, our culture here as well. Uh, so we, we think that the branding is more than just a logo, right? It's, it's a culture and everything that ties in together with it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, so going back to lead gen strategies, what is your, what's your favorite marketing channel? Favorite? I really like PPC. Okay. Um, but I do believe the most potential is going to be Facebook. Okay. Um, and, and the reasons for that are PPC. I mean, there's just so much you can do with it and so many different campaigns and the analytics on Google are just so good, but Facebook's analytics are really good. It's really low cost per, per click loss, low cost per conversion for us at least, but the actual close rate is much less on Facebook. Sure. Um, because they're not as actively searching as someone as PPC. They're ready, they're ready to buy now. Yep. Uh, and that's what excites me about P Facebook though. If we can figure out how to get that close rate a little bit higher, um, the, the cost for conversions are just so low. Right. And they're really like that. that's like, for me, that's the next exciting thing for us to figure out is our, our social media paid advertising. Um, trying to figure out the proper strategy for that because I think that's where a lot of, uh, a lot of strong potential lies. Got it. And, um, like yeah. our bread and butter. Got, what, say the last part again. He's been like our bread and butter. You can say, yeah. What do you, um, overall, what do you guys spend on a monthly basis in, in marketing? Spending about, like we just raised it because we're trying out some new new shotgun campaigns and then we're going to be cutting them in the month to see what's performing the best. Um, but we're spending close to 30,000. 30, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you're running five or six days a week for, for production? Right. Six. Well, we run seven days a week, but seven appointment only. Okay. So like, it's not a scheduled day, but when we have to put jobs, we'll put that on there and we'll get extra guys to come in. Got it. So 30K a month. Um, do you mind if I ask how many jobs you're doing on a daily basis? Mixture between uh, demo, uh, junk, dumpsters, kind of a all encompassing? 
Yeah, so, and again, so those numbers, for, for example, like 30K is on pace. We plan on cutting that back down because sure. um, we're doing that shotgun approach right now and trying to see what what's worth investing more in. Right. Um, but for like dumpsters, dumpsters were averaging, we're at capacity. So I think we're averaging like 35 book jobs, book jobs a week. Okay. And then the duration is a little bit longer, but that's been because we don't have any more dumpsters to rent. Sure. Um, and uh, COVID actually has been good for the industry in that regard for dumpsters. Uh, and it takes so long to buy new dumpsters and get them in. So um, that's one thing. And then junk removal. Uh, so I can pull up the metrics on top of my head, but I believe we usually run, try to get up to like, you know, seven routes and, and then five. Yeah. Typically, typically three to five jobs per route. So we do four times seven, even that's 49. Plus that's right. There's my math going on this. <laughs> yeah. Wait, if you do four four jobs a route, and then you have five to seven routes, six seven routes, so then uh, and then plus Saturday. So whatever that math is, four times. Some um, dozens. So for being being analytical, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> my my oh, simple math is the best best strategy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we we do a fairly fairly amount of that. If I want to calculate it right now. Sure. So. Uh... So I, I, years and years ago, I came from the, the limo industry and, and that industry is heavy on dispatch, um, figuring out where, where pickups are, drop-offs, mitigating, you know, lost time in between jobs. Yeah. Um, for you guys, what, what software are you guys using to, to manage the business day to day? So we use Bonigo right now. Um, not throat on it, you know, it does what we do, but, uh, there's other softwares that have higher capabilities, but from a cost perspective, it's sure. decent. I know a lot of the guys in the industry use like House Call Pro and yep. some really uh, low investment type of software. Uh, but our goal is to build our own yep. because we were very complex in how we do some things. Mm -hmm. um, and we want more proprietary software, but yep. software costs a lot of money. Sure. But same thing with logistics, we do all our manual, we have to do all our stuff manually. Like, like it, it's all mapped out on there. Yep. But we manually adjust it. There's no way to logistically route it. Uh, yeah system do it on its own we manually make sure that it's a short yeah. and then delays get thrown in all of a sudden it's the, yeah. the checkerboard starts well, one thing comes into that is even if it could do it all the time there's there's um what's the word i'm looking for uh information that the system would ever have right so if, if they need to, the system needs to know well this job has this type of debris and yep. this well, there's the routing yeah that's the quickest route but there's no disposal facility in that area or there's no donation or there's no recycle so you have to really customize it. And a lot of that's actually, we'll set up the best of our ability logistics wise on our end and we'll zone it. So we'll yep. zone it by county and that does happen through the system. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it automatically goes in the system, we'll go to that default on zone and then we'll touch it up to what makes the most sense. A lot of them on the crews, um, you know, making those decisions on their own and while they're on the route, Got it. whether they readjust it or not. Got it. How, how much, um, not how much, how important was getting the logistics piece of it down as you grew the business and, and you had more um, pieces moving and at, at, at any given day and things could break down and jobs take longer. Um, obviously it's a headache to, to get good yeah. at a piece of it, but like talk me through that piece of dispatch logistics for your business as you grew. The more dispatch or routing? Like as far as like maybe the most route or both. Yeah. Um, so I guess too, like in any kind of, company structure you have to build the accountability of like who's seat and who's, yeah. who's it going to and how many people are being notified um and then you know the zoning it was big for us and putting on those zip codes and then and yeah. having hey no matter where the shop goes our call center and sales team knows it was on this route no matter what and the, the, the it defaults on its own but for us like one thing that people don't really solve by enough too is like the more jobs you get yes it could be hectic but it's actually an opportunity to make things much much more efficient yep. just through its own version of economies of scale, right? The more jobs you have, the likelihood, if you're not expanding farther like we did in EPA, if you keep it local, you're more likely to have jobs already near each other, which are going to improve your logistics and improve your efficiency. Yep. So that was a big thing for us is as we grew and expanded, all of a sudden our margins kept going up from just logistics alone because the routes were tighter. Yep. Um, and then from like a managing standpoint, we're more familiar with the areas. We're familiar with the dumps. We have more relationships with the dumps, other facilities. Um, even like being just understanding what roads are for, you know, these are 14.5 GBW 14 trucks. So just have an understanding of what back roads to go and not to go and, and what, 
you know, whatever is flood, all those little things that you take for granted come into play when you're more condensed. Yep. Uh, as far as logistics go. Got it. And um, as far as dispatch now, is how many dispatchers do you have working? So we have on our sales team and call center team, we have um, five guys, but then depending on what the, what it is, like on an actual, that's for more or less, we, we view our sales team as everything before it gets on the calendar, before it gets on the schedule. And then from there, it goes to our, our operations team, okay. uh, which consists of GM, fleet and facilities manager, uh, operations manager, and admin. Okay. Um, and it's really just one one main direct dispatcher as far as for those jobs and routing. Yep. And then just report structure, go to the next person if they don't hear. Um, that's just for that local dispatching of just flow and operations where you are. Got the majority it. of the handles most of it um, being set up. And then the guys are kind of more independently on their own after that. Add-ons and stuff will come in and then he'll just, you know, shoot them a text, text them, or the system will email them saying, hey, add-on, just heads up, watch it. But we try to put more autonomy onto the guys to limit how many office staff we need. Sure. Um, Got it. Cool. Um, talk to me about um, revenue per truck that you shoot for before you know that it's time to order the next truck or the next dumpster. What do you associate, you know, increases in, in monthly uh, revenue before it dings and says, okay, it's time to get the new one? Well, so we don't really view it as much as like revenue per truck to when we buy the next truck. We view it revenue per, per like assets and revenue per um, about school. So like this industry is like, and we're still trying to get better at forecasting it. Cause like when you, when you, a lot of times because it takes time, you can't just, all right, we need trucks and get it tomorrow. There's a lot of downtime until you get that next truck yeah. as far as getting it registered and getting it wrapped and everything else too and just buying it. And, the, and they're usually a lot of times custom manufacturers with the hook lifts we have on. So we're still trying to get better at forecasting that. Yeah. But typically we view it as, as if once we're at capacity with our, with the, not just our routing, but really our trucks. Okay. We're looking at this one spare runner that can either run containers if something goes down. Yep. Um, and then if we're booked three, four days out, we're, we're starting to lose work at that point. That's our ideal time to expand. But yeah. we need consistency, right? One big week doesn't mean that you're looking for that consistency. Hey, how often are we actually booking out? Because yep. industry, it's a, a lot of it's boom, boom. So like most people want same day, next day service. So you can have, I remember we were still growing, but I remember there was a time where we had zero jobs one day. And in the very beginning, we had to, or zero jobs for the next day. And this was like in year one. And whatever it was, and I, we didn't like giving guys, laying guys off, giving guys off because they wanted the hours. Yep. In the beginning, we knew it was because we weren't doing enough marketing. So like, all right, we'll have you come in the next day and we'll find something for you to do and whatever. And we booked like 16 jobs in that time span for the next day. Uh, it's crazy how like, just by how much, you know, just when calls come in and they want to book, yep. you can book them that same day or next day. They're ready to do the work. So uh, it, it's tough to say. It's still something we're trying to get better at. But we like to say if you're booked out and, put, and turning jobs away consistently, um, and I, I think no more booked out than a week, yep. you know, and that's the time you start considering that. Yep. Uh, but do you have the capacity at the same time to handle whether it's staffing or whether it's, you know, not just your extra capacity with the trucks, but your, your staff. How many, as you add more trucks, how much internal staff do you need to add? Yep. And that's why the big thing is having a call center is so important um, for people that like the franchises. Uh, just because it's not about do you have do you need how many guys to be on the phones at all times? It's how many guys do you need on the phones when you have surges? When you get 10 phone calls at once, do you have enough guys to to handle that or get back to them quickly? Yeah. One of the worst things any business can do is not answer the phone. Sure. So that's where it, it, it comes down to. Well, I'm excited as we scale, we get more efficiency with our labor costs and the call center and more efficient with our, our dispatching costs and, and office costs just because, uh, you know, we, we, we don't technically need all day long. We don't always need the staffing, but we need it for those surges. We need it when the, when the fire happens when the truck breaks down or people call out, we need those additional staffing options. Um, but as you scale, those get minimal if you scale properly. And that's why we're honing so much in on building our systems to, to allow us to scale. Sure. Um, walk through some systems. Like how did you learn how to build systems? Are there any books that you've read um, that kind of walked you through it? Um, what's yeah, your so, I mean, we're still learning, right? So we're still trying to figure that out. Um, I think I always yeah, thank my, my family for certain things. My dad uh, is a general manager uh, for a company and yeah, he pretty much 
owns a lot of a lot of things over there. My mom's a real estate agent, um, and she's always worked, you know, 16, 17 hour days. Uh, so I've seen that kind of self starter mentality where you just have to build that. Yep. Um, and then just an obsession with, again, with trying to scale. And the only way that happens is with those systems. Um, so that's where it starts, like the the obsession with them, but then getting better at them. Um, Trial and error, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of books we read and podcasts we listen to as well, and then just trying to take and, and, and improve on each time. Sure. Um, and then, yeah, we, op- we also operate on traction. Okay. Um, are you familiar with that? Yep. So we operate in there, uh, still getting better at IDSing and, and you know, doing our, our, you know, solving our issues that way and really communicating better, better as a leadership team. Uh, but every, almost everything we do right now is all systems. Like we, we have, we have a good product. Um, well, great product. Um, yeah, great company, everything else. But again, it, that's, there's different issues, right? People usually get stuck to starting a company. There's people that get stuck at the 300 grand mark. People that get stuck at 500 to a million. There's always new challenges as you reach the ceiling. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that, what, what is it? The average business doesn't last more than new startup less than three years or like 95 after five years, like 98, yeah. 10 years. Uh, so yeah, we're luckily to be going on five and going very, very strong. Um, but it's, it's for us, if we're like if we're, if we're at one location and 35 employees, which is great, you yeah, know, not by itself, but for us, that is on the timeline, we're at the very start still. So we're not nearly what our goals are. And we know we're not going to get there without systems to that, to that end goal. Um, cause we need to scale because every single time we've tried to leave and, and do something else, we've realized that our, like if, if I wanted to add two more routes today, um, I just know our inefficiencies would scale with us. Um, you know, so we have to really be strong with our systems moving talk, forward. Talk to me. Talk to me about that. Explain what that means for someone that's, um, you know, maybe they maybe they're adding their second truck and they don't have real good systems in place. They can make the phone ring, but the operation side they're a little bit lax on that. Talk to me about that um, inefficiency scale with you. So uh, especially a lot of times too, like part of the inefficiencies that the guys think about is like, all right, well, if I just get more jobs, I can hire more people, right? And then I'll get more people to do that. We still have to train those people, right? And, and then the people that aren't trained, then you have to go headaches and, and go talk to them and manage those people and fire them, and retrain, all of those, everything else in between. Sure. Yeah, you know, scaling doesn't solve any issues you have. It only multiplies them. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, the only thing it might help with is Cash flow, but even a cash flow standpoint, you're saying, oh, my disposal costs are, are too high. So if I scale, though, my revenue will be higher. Well, again, same training issues, or anything else. Well, your guys are going to start dumping more of your scrap. You're going to start not donating to that. Everything will scale with it yep. if you don't have a system to, to keep control and then make like systems are predictable as well. So, again, going back to the forecasting and all that, like, and you can think of scaling, buy two trucks, and then Oh shit! I wasn't ready to scale. I actually don't have the business, and I have two more assets that I got to pay for. Mm-hmm. So it's it's for us. It's if, again, if we even did this more, we would do so many more systems. If I do it all over again, I would have so many systems from day one. Uh, it's a lot easier to build systems when you're small than when you're large. Because even right now, we're doing a whole new training system, uh, and it's a lot more difficult to implement when we could have been creeping away out of it. Now I have. All of our guys have to start from, we have to train them all once again sure. and to build that out. Um, so what's a system a guy with, a, with one truck would, uh, should have? Like walk me through a typical day and, and there's a great book, um, Work the System. Have you ever mm-hmm. read it? I have not. It's, it's awesome. Um, I interviewed him on an old podcast I used to have back in the day. But basically he had this epiphany that uh, business is just systems bouncing into different systems and it takes... Right all throughout the day and you just have to have um, every piece has to have its own system. So walk me through like an example of like a one, one truck guy, what system should he have in place to, to operate the business at a basic level? On a basic, just operational level, right. It's, you know, going out and like in the morning, um, what's your, what's your truck maintenance system, right? How are you keeping your trucks on the road? So again, how often are you, are you making sure that operationally, like, again, think of it like an inspection, it's all that stuff passing. Whether you're doing that once a month, um, or once a week, daily, yep. it's only a system when it's replicable and repeatable. So again, you checking once isn't a system. But you putting something in place where you're checking it every week, mm-hmm. making sure that that truck doesn't go down, not only costs you costs as far as to repair it, but downtime and again, where you could opportunity costs where you could be making money. So keeping your trucks on the road is really important. 
just a checklist for the tools and supplies you want to be having on there, um, as well as like a post trip, making sure after the job goes out, again, like damages. These guys are going to damage stuff on the road all day. It's a lot easier to maintain when you're small. Mm -hmm. so that's like something to like, you know, especially you don't realize when you, when you scale. All right, I can catch one guy when he damages the truck because there's one truck. When you have 10 trucks, yep. like, when the fuck did that happen? And my, my apologies for very, very aggressive. They're like, when, when did that happen? And they're like, I don't know. And you look at the next truck, next truck, it piles. You can't keep track of it. Right. Um, you don't have a proper system to do that. And now we have like a photo verification system after every trip and all that different stuff to keep better track of it. But I would just start with the trucks. Again, making, making sure those guys, that's what makes you money. That's on the road at all times. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and when you start off, it's, you know, if you're buying a $65,000, $75,000 truck, you want to make sure that asset's you know, uh, in good shape. Yep. Um, then it comes down to simple you know, routing, logistics, planning your day out in the morning at all times, um, condensing your routes to make sure there's not much dead time in between. Um, then all that stuff can just be simplified and a simple checklist in the morning that it's repeatable every day. Hey, yep. you know, check your emails, check your fine tuning routing, follow up with your missed calls. Just the easiest way is a simple checklist yep. that you just know that you're doing every day. Um, and I always like to say, uh, I forget what, what book is it? When the, the checklists are really built for um, your smartest people, and it they're is, really just um, the checklist manifesto. Not might not be that, but but there's something like that, and they they probably they all share knowledge, right? right. But really, it comes down to like people think you know. Checklists are for idiots. No, checklists are for smart people. Surgeon, pilot, as a reminder. Yeah. Yep. All the checklists are supposed to be a reminder of some intricate you've already learned and just doing that again. Right. Um, so I, I just, I'm, I'm a really big fan of checklists and using a system, you know, maybe, you can, I mean, you can do some sort of Google Sheets, but, or Google Sheets, but, you know, Microsoft to do or whatever that just has it on repeat that, you know, Hey, every day you're doing this again. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's the most essential. What is the most essential stuff for you to run your day to day? Uh, and just put them to a checklist is, is the most simple way to start of anything. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, talk to me about um, marketing efforts that you thought were going to work really well that just bombed and you wouldn't do them again. Um, we, it's like, for example, we just did Valpac twice. Um, and we knew it had a really low ratio for the, the ROI. Sure. Um, one of our goals was, again, just that brand awareness. Whereas if we had enough brand awareness, uh, or if, even if we were getting a low return on it, it's still giving us more brand awareness. It's still giving more trucks on the road. And maybe just seeing the, the ad isn't enough, but our philosophy is the more the trucks are on the road, well, that's more marketing as well, right? The more exposure we have, any way we can get these trucks on the road, it's more business. Um, but we did it twice. And I got lower on the second one. And we tried different copy and different returns. Yep. And something about that, because there's some markets, about that does really well. Yeah, works well. I don't think about that does as well in our market. I get the mailers at my parents' house. And um, it's like, it's just so flooded um, with material. And the amount of other junk mail they're getting on top of that, Sure. You know, direct mailer. Yep. Yep. Might be stronger on that. Um, there's a couple, there's a lot of different lead gen sites that are popping up. It's really pop popular right now for people to create their own lead gen sites. Mm -hmm. um, so we get spam mail on a lot of them. We'll still check them out because they might be returned, they might be good yep. at it. Um, but we tried uh, Porch. Porch was one that it just didn't do well. Uh, Smith didn't do well for us, like these little that. Thumbtack, I'm not a big fan of. Okay. You know, there's certain lead gen sites that we, when we really track the return and how much effort it is to actually book on there and competitive, yep. uh, it's not worth the time. For, for a smaller job, for a smaller company, when you're willing to sacrifice your margins more, um, yeah, it's not bad. Yep. You, but as you're trying to scale, like, your margins are really important for you yep. consistently. So those, again, those low end leads, I, I, I definitely rec recommend trying everything in your market, sure. but you gotta be quick to cut some things. Again, even our new shotgun approaches now. Yep. Uh, Valpac, the reason I go that too, that was expensive. It's 2,200 a month locked in for four months. And when you're a smaller company, you can't afford it. That's why I feel like I love the direct yeah. market other sides. When you're a smaller company, you can't afford that. Yep. You can't afford to be wrong. You can afford it to be right if it gives you right. money. Uh, being locked into that for so much. So again, I, I just, there's, there's so much stuff that varies on market and the varies on your company and your pitch. And also, Anything is your smaller company and you can't pick up the phone right then and there. I'd avoid any of those, especially if you're paying for it, yep. especially if it's going to multiple vendors. 
So if you do a thumbtack or a home advisor, you can't answer the phone within a minute. And we, our policy is 10 seconds. So if you can't answer in a minute, your chances drastically drop whether you're going to book that call. It's all about who gets there. So. so I think that's the thing too. It's just all about what's your capacity as a company. Yep. And just mean that, like, are you going to be able to answer that call right away? Um, Cause that's one of the things is like our first thing on sales is just pick up the phone fast. And, and that's your first impression. And that also allows them not to go anywhere else. Right, right. Um, how much of your business is commercial? Property management companies? Um, no, no, no. We're definitely more of a consumer brand. Um, sure. That's because the marketing side. And we're so concentrated in building systems and, and different things. And like I was so heavily involved yep. with our partners in the beginning. And then I went to a new GM. Then I went to another new GM. And doing that, we lost some relationships. Um, I would say... It's really probably about like 80, 20. Um, and that's including connectors. So I view a connector as like a real estate agent. Okay. So they're, not, they're not paying for the service. Sure. They're connected to the, the client, right? A property manager group that they're paying for the service, yeah, that's B to B. But any kind of person that, that like professional organizer, same thing. If you're not paying for the service, you're just connecting us to the so client. Yeah. yeah, it's influencer, yeah, we're just going connectors. So there's a large portion of that 20% in there. If you actually do true commercial, with property managers, um, actually just commercial facilities, uh, and taking out dumpsters. If I take out dumpsters, maybe 10%. Dumpsters are a higher commercial because a lot of construction. Um, but yeah, we don't, that's one thing we definitely have a lot of room to improve on is okay. getting more commercial business. So we're, we're launching new campaigns. We even have a new account manager, you know, controlling our, um, uh, our B2B you know, presence and relationships with them. Uh, but that's one thing we're, we're excited to. I think the harder part is becoming that consumer brand. Yep. Um, and I think this is going to be kind of the easier part, you know, just nurturing those relationships. Got it. Um, are you guys doing retargeting on any of your platforms? We are. Um, we, I know we stopped it on our, our PPC okay. campaign. Um, I like retargeting for me, like more um, on B2B, more of those connectors and partners. Okay. Uh, only because... And, and this is, I actually got from JRA um, slightly as well, just because the buying decision in the PPC market so is, fast. they're fast, right? So they're usually not doing research coming back to it. Yep. During that search term, it's pretty fast and that's what retargeting is not gonna do a whole much. Yep. Um, I don't have the full analytics to back that up, but I agree with that philosophy. Um, so we do more, we've been doing more on, on the social and, and you yeah, um, know, I'm just, uh, I know that he's been, I think he just started doing some YouTube stuff too. Uh, I would say we could definitely do better on it, but we, we don't do a whole lot on it. And part of that is just because that buying curve, like the buying decision is so quick. Sure. But I like doing more in B2B because I, I want to stay in front of our B2B right. partners or potential partners as much as possible. Right, right, right. Okay. So um, talked about early on that you are in the process of franchising the business. Um, what, are your, what are your goals for the business? Where do you see yourself? You're five years in now. What's the 10 year goal? What's the 15 year goal? Where, where do you see yourself taking this business? So, I mean, our, our, our primary mission here, right, is, is to create opportunity, um, you know, for our teams, for our staff, and the people that want to join our family, right? Mm -hmm. Everything we do is in the pursuit of new career opportunities for our employees. Um, and we do that by creating an amazing experience um, and, and creating a company and a brand that customers truly want to be a part of, not just use the service because it's a great service, but again, building that brand um, is, is so much bigger than, and the, than just delivering the product, right? So uh, in that vision, you know, we want to be obviously become a household name. Um, in the five-year vision, we know that we want to have, um, we want to have 25 locations for, on the franchise side. Okay. Um, we don't know how much we're going to push the corporate uh, continue, but Again, five locations on the corporate side. It takes longer to scale. You need more capital, right? You can scale faster with franchising. Um, you know, looking to have the the call center, you know, flushed out with you know twenty reps at that time. Um, and I don't, again, I don't have the. I, we have a VTO and all the numbers pulled up in front of me. Uh, but remember, it's on the top of my head is not always my forte. But again, in our, again, up from five year to ten year vision, you know. The way that things can scale, and if you do this right, like the goal, if you want to sell more franchises, be the best franchise, right? Simple as that. You know, how, how again, people are going to buy into the opportunity as well as the culture. But, uh, you know, in, in that 10-year span, 
you know, open to have 100, 100 locations. So again, it, it's, everything sounds like a big number, but even my partner, when, one day when he's like, oh, you guys are gonna do, you know, uh, 200, 240,000 is the first year of revenue prediction. And we well surpassed that in the first year. Um, and then second year and third year continuous growth, right? And same thing, that 100, when you, when you break down your reverse engineer, it's not that hard to come, like think about how, you, how to get to there. It comes down to systems. You build the system, you scale the system. So that's really our main focus is just building that in to get to that 10 year vision, that, that three year, five year, 10 year vision. Um, and you know, the, the God jumps of the world right now, I think they're doing right around 400 million in, in the junk noodle space, I think. And then O2E brands are doing a little bit more as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, but your goal is, you know, half a million dollar company, right? How do you expand to that level? And it comes down from building all these little systems on top of each other to keep scaling. Got it. Okay. Um, what's your advice to a guy brand new in the space? Just got his uh, box truck or he's got a trailer on the back of a pickup truck. What's your advice to someone just getting rolling, say, first, first quarter? Six months into the business, get a dump truck. Dump truck. Dump truck. Okay. Uh, we have a box truck. We even have the box truck now, and it's just such a. It's not even just a game changer as far as doing a job. Um, like stuff we talked about, it just changes your mindset. Going back to, again, what is the indirect value of, of your freedom, your time, right? Especially when you're on the trucks. Yep. So if you can lose an hour of time when you're a small owner operator, well, that's an hour of time if you're not doing other work. That you can be building the business, right? Not tying as much, you can run the guy to the dump. So just think about it too, that opportunity cost of you being tied to doing more physical labor is not helping you do actual work, right? Or actually actually working on the business to build it. Um, again, I know it's tough with the capital. So yeah. if you don't have the capital right away, then make the sacrifices that you need to do, whether that's working more, pay cuts, whatever you're doing in the beginning. You know, we did not pay ourselves for a very long time. Uh, and just reinvesting and reinvesting. And, and that's probably number two. Put the money back into. Again, again, according to how big you want to be, set clear goals and expectations. If you want to be a $500,000 company, a $100,000 operation, whatever it is, that's something wrong with that. Because um, one thing about to tell you, like we've had some success and success is exhausting. <laughs> like it's a lot of work mm -hmm. uh, and we're still not there where we want to be. Uh, and that's not for everyone. You definitely lose your family time with that. So set clear expectations. Get yourself a dump truck, whatever. You didn't get to use one. It's fine. Take care of that. Yep. And, and just kind of go from there. But yeah, doing it all by working smarter, not harder, right? That's why, you know, get done. Got it. Okay. What about advice for the guy 18 months in? He's got some cash on hand. He just bought a dump truck. What would be your advice at that point? So he's moving. He's got to get off the dump truck. What's that? Get off the dump truck. You know, okay. Yeah, you get some guys in there, start building the systems to have them so you can see, continue working on the business, right? Okay. So that's kind of the, the, the structure. Get, we get a dump truck, then get the hell off the dump truck. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. fair enough. Yeah. All right, so um, coming down to the final four questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I call this my final four. Uh, what's the last book that you read? Uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. That's a great book. What's your favorite book? Um, David Goggins Can't Hurt Me. Dude, I just... Just read that book. Oh my I just God. I'm going through a wall right now. Yeah. Oh my God. I started walking 10 miles a day after, after reading that book. Incredible book. Yeah. Um, such a unique individual. Um, what advice would you give yourself? Uh, how old are you? I'm 29. 29. Okay. I put 20 year old self. Um, you know, basically just getting started on your entrepreneurial journey. What would your advice be? I, I think. It goes with my obsession with that, like, like start now and meaning that again, trusting that I've always had ideas and processes and I still have new ideas, right? But I want to get off track. Um, but the fear of failure is always the one that, that stops you. And mm -hmm. I would just say start now, especially, and this is what even helped us from starting the company when we started, I was able to live at home. I was able to defer my loans. I was able to put money on my credit card and take a chance and risk. And the younger you are and the less commitment you have, the more risk you can take and more you can sustain. So while you're 20, you have so much freedom, especially in, not everyone has the same family lives. I understand that, but a lot of times you have more support structure. Um, so take that risk now and start now, but start, I, I wouldn't just rush into it, but start with some systems, start with a game plan, mm -hmm. plan it out. And I, I don't think most things are that hard. Like I think most people are really, really capable of it. 
Um, you just got to find out what you're passionate in. But if you think you're passionate about something, start. And again, you can, can accomplish it. So yeah, if I had started when I was 20, that five-year plan would be right now, right? We'd have a different conversation, I think. Sure. Uh, oh, and then read. Read? Um, yeah. yeah. Self-education. Yeah. How often do you read? Do you set a number on what you want per month or per what? Uh, Audible. So I what, you read. So I'm um, trying to do a book a week. I just started Blinkist. Okay. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. It's, it's summaries. So it's just. I ended up buying book summaries on, uh, on Audible. It's, it's, it's a 15, 30, 15 to 30 minute version. Yeah. Of the yep. uh, and I'm trying to do flashcards. Okay. Uh, instead on basic principles every yeah. night to try to learn those. And so because I, I listen to an Audible or any book. I gotta listen to it five times. Yeah, because yeah, I, I, I keep rewinding it, rewinding it, rewinding it. And right. my brain is in a million different places because you're being pulled in a million different directions. Yep. Um, but again, like, that's not like a book. Again, you, you do a book a week, it's 52 books in a year. Most people yep. have, like, I never even read a full book like during school. Yep. So, again, Audible's, there's different avenues out there. Audible's an easy one. And then start with books that you enjoy, right? Like, Can't Hurt Me. Yep. Yeah, just any, anyone yeah. could have a book. Incredible story. Yeah. I got uh, I got Jocko's book up next. That's uh, yeah, so, yeah. My 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 my, my brother-in-law, my partner, came in and he was like talking about running a triathlon and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, like it makes you want to do that. Absolutely. You talk about it, it's like not about motivation, but you get you get motivated. But then yeah. it does drag you up and down. So yeah. setting realistic expectations will help you actually win. Like those yep. micro wins. Yep. Well. Awesome. All right. Last question is best advice you've ever gotten, and who gave it to you? So the best advice I ever gotten and who gave it to me, because I have a couple times I just remember that were important, like in my, in, that have shaped me. Mm -hmm. um, and nothing as much recently as when I was younger. And like this um, one time, it's a small as like a gym teacher. I remember they pulled me aside. And one thing he just said, and I never understood it till like now I think I understand longer. And he just pulled me aside and he was just like, yeah, when you go, when you walk in the hallway, just say hi to someone new and smile and see what kind of difference it makes. And I didn't understand why he asked me to do that now. And now I'm reading books and you know, again, like how to win friends and influence people and talks about it. And it's just like the power that you have to influence people um, and the tiniest little things, right? So one of our core values here is be a hero. Um, and that doesn't mean save the world. It means those tiny things, right? It means doing the little things that, that influence people and make mean the world to them. Um, and I think that's something more and more I'm realizing like that have shaped me over my life. It's just, I always want to impact others in a positive way uh, and help build them. Like for again, anything, any scale that we don't reach, I feel like it's my fault. Like I let my team down. Um, so I don't know, that's something that's always stuck with me. And I was like a sophomore in high school. Sure. Um, and I've gotten so many little life lessons over time. But my, my thing is, I just get that. It's like, you, you just said, we all have so much power to influence people around us and again good vibes and just you know again make people's make people's day little things and i don't know it just means a lot to me and that's that's a lot of what we're, what we're trying to build here awesome this has been a lot of fun um this is jake still from uh junk rescue out of jersey jake if people want to reach out and say hello and say great job in the interview how do they get a hold of you uh they can email me at jake at junk hyphen rescue.com um, and then, uh, you know, they can, uh, go check out our website, junk rescuecom There's a contact on there as well. Um, but yeah, email is usually the best, best way to easily get a hold of me. Cool. And, uh, you know, I, I view, again, a lot of people come down with competition. I view competition as a good thing. Yep. Create more demand in the marketplace. Uh, I like to bet on ourselves. I like talking and sharing information. Uh, so if you guys want to collaborate and have some conversations, especially it doesn't have to be the junk removal space too. If you're in the service industry, um, in general, it's majority the same, a lot of the same issues. Um, so again, we, we have conversations all the time with other vendors. Uh, so I'm more than happy to discuss and honestly, that's happy to excited to discuss anything with you guys and sharing our story, learning your story and then collaborating. Awesome. Um, if someone's interested in, in franchising, is that an open waiting list or how does that process work for you guys? Yeah. So again, we're talking to everyone right now. So all prospects, we're just not pushing uh, forward with it as far as you know if they want them to buy today and like say hey shut up and take my money um, yeah as much as we love that sure. we, yeah again it's all about making sure that we're, we're properly able to support you 
And while we're fairly confident we do a very good job right now, yep. we want to be very confident that we can give you everything you want and more. Um, so again, they can reach out immediately. I would love to have a conversation. And one thing I leave everyone with, you know, I've always been told in my life that I've had a lot of luck and I've always viewed it the, the more opportunities you create, the more you put yourself out there, the more luck you will find. Yep. So again, if you're looking to make a change in your life, backhand, whatever, a conversation with me as far as franchise and anything else doesn't have to lead to buying a franchise. The more you build habits of putting yourself out there, talking to people and taking chances, you're going to find yourself, you have more opportunities and suddenly it's going to be the right time, right situation. And, you know, maybe you find some luck and, you know, for whatever reason you call us and you know that this is the right time, the right opportunity to, to build something great with us and, um, you know, right marketplace, whatever. Um, again, let's start that conversation now so you guys can find some more luck down the road. Awesome. I love it. This has been great. Thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, and I hope, you know, stay in touch as well. Um, so, again, you know how to reach me. And, uh, yeah, again, I, I appreciate you having me on. And uh, I look forward to, you know, possible business in the future together. Awesome. I love it. Thank you very much.